Hi there, Professor Schimmel back with part four of our survey of some parasitic protozoans. And we're gonna pick it up with the next phylum. Uh, the phylum is Mastigophora, and these protozoans are modal by means of flagella. Um, all right, I've got a few examples I wanna discuss with you in this group. First of all is Giardia lamlia. Uh, and this, uh, this protozoan causes a disease known as uh, Giardiasis and also sometimes causes something called giardial malabsorption syndrome. I'll talk more about that as we uh, move through this section. Um, now, giardia lamlia is the name that we've traditionally used for this protozoan, but it is, um, oh, I don't know how long ago this occurred, a few years ago. It has actually technically been reclassified as giardia intestinalis, uh, but I think that um, use either name and people are certainly going to know what you're talking about. All right now this is a, um, a, a cosmopolitan parasite. It's very common, uh, even seen with some regularity here in Southern California. And we've got um, uh, two stages in its life cycle. We've got both a trophozoite stage and a cyst stage. You know, before I go on with that thought, I wanted to mention that Giardia lamlia happens to be the most common intestinal parasite in the United States. Not only can it infect humans, it can infect other species of mammals as, as well. I've heard of cases of dogs, um, horses, alpacas even, uh, that have been infected with Giardia. Okay, so um, trophozoite and a cyst stage, those are our life cycle stages. And um, just to, to make a general remark here, uh, you can safely assume, uh, I guess maybe there are some exceptions, but I certainly can't think of any, but when we're talking about life cycle stages in the protozoans, if we've got both a trophozoite and a cyst stage, you can go ahead and assume that the cyst is the infectious stage and the trophozoite is the active stage and the one that's actually going to uh, cause damage potentially to the host and cause the symptoms of the disease. <clears throat> All right, let's see. What do you have in your notes? What do I have? Um, you don't have, you, you just have some major bullet points here. Okay, so you've got a, um, um, a photo of a trophozoite of Giardia uh, lamlia in your, um, in your outline. Let's go ahead and talk about um, how do you become infected? Well, that would be by ingestion of uh, fecal contaminated water. Uh, typically in um, like um, uh, mountain or river streams treating uh, or excuse me drinking untreated water in those situations not a good idea because as I said a couple of minutes ago um, many mammals can be infected including um, wild animals and if they defecate in or near uh, the water then you ingest that water and you can become infected less commonly so uh, well water has been documented to be uh, infected with the uh, Giardia lamlia cysts. Let, let's say we have um, a wild population in the area that uh, maybe has a high infection rate and they're defecating um, near the, um, the, the groundwater supply or it gets into the groundwater supply. So it could possibly happen that way. Um, all right, so trophozoite and cyst. Cyst is the infectious stage. Now we looked at the uh, trophozoid stage, or we will, depending on uh, where we are in the semester, in the laboratory. Now, um, and so what you saw using a, a bright field microscope was um, a, a teardrop, uh, teardrop-shaped trophozoid, and there are um, twin nuclei in this trophozoid, and you may or may not have been able to see those depending on uh, the trophozoite that you um, you found with your microscope. Now, what you can't see using a bright field microscope is on the um, the ventral side, ventral dorsal ventral ventral side so, uh, ventral side of the trophozoite. There is a large sucking disc, right? It's essentially a um, a suction cup. And now remember when we talked about entamoeba histolytica, I talked about uh, the amoeba producing those proteolytic enzymes. They literally digest host tissues and it formed um, uh, literally perforations in the lining of the intestine. That's not what's going to happen with Giardia. It's going to, rather than um, perforate the intestinal lining, it's going to literally, with those suction cups, um, uh, attach itself very efficiently to the lining of the intestine. 
Um, all right, let's see what else do I want to tell you. Oh, yeah, and that sucking disc, um, especially when infections become heavy, and, and they will over time if the patient isn't treated, they can cause significant damage to the lining of the intestine, making it difficult for the infected individual to absorb absorb certain nutrients, most specifically um, lipids and um, also um, fat-soluble vitamins. So um, that's called giardial malabsorption syndrome. Okay, let's see now. Um, incubation. The Centers for Disease Control in 2015 stated that the uh, average incubation is one to three weeks after ingestion of the uh, cyst stage of the organism. And then what we're going to see for symptoms is the beginning of um, what can be chronic, sometimes intermittent, and uh, exceptionally abundant diarrhea. All right, now uh, this diarrhea will alternate with oily stools, and I'm sorry, uh, and they may be um, uh, unusual in color. Uh, I've heard, uh, or I've read, excuse me, I've read accounts of uh, the diarrhea being like a gray color, and I know this is a subjective thing, but even for diarrhea, it's apparently very foul smelling. Um, also, um, remember the oily stools I mentioned a moment ago? How could you forget, right? Well, there will be evidence of that uh, in the form of um, a layer of oily material floating on the surface of the toilet water. Uh, hope you're not like, you know, eating a snack or anything right now. Uh, the patient will, as you can well imagine, also be belching foul tasting gas. Uh, they will have um, abdominal cramps and bloating, weight loss. Now, these symptoms may go on for a couple of weeks, and then the patient may uh, think that they're starting to feel better and uh, have a, you know, uh, a little period of time where the uh, symptoms aren't um, occurring, and then they will occur again. Uh, here's a little tidbit of advice, and that is, is if you have diarrhea for more than three days, that's not right. Go see your doctor about it. All right, now, um, how do you diagnose? Well, you can, uh, you can uh, if you're lucky anyways, look for trophozoites and or cysts in fecal samples of the patient. May not be so easy to find. Um, first of all, because the patient is having diarrhea, the stool is moving through the body so quickly that cysts may not have enough time to form. So there may not be any cysts um, in the diarrhea or very, very few, which may be a challenge to find. Uh, and the trophozoites are so firmly attached to the intestinal lining, again, you got to get lucky uh, to find some in the stool patient of the sample. So you're probably going to need to take several stool uh, samples over a period of time when the patient is uh, symptomatic and also asymptomatic. When they're asymptomatic, you might find some cysts in there. Uh, now, we can also test the patient's blood for the presence of antibodies against Giardia, and um, I doubt you're going to be able to see this in much detail, and I didn't include it in your outline, but you could Google it. Um, just for your um, amusement uh, and um, edification, there is a test for the presence of uh, Giardia called the string test. Here's how it works. Um, large gelatin capsule contains a very thin um, line that's um, neatly wound up in the gelatin capsule. And then there's a, a hole in one end of the gelatin capsule and you pull the string out. And then what you do is you, um, you tape uh, the um, loose end of the string to the patient's cheek and you have the patient swallow the gelatin capsule. And then after a period of time, it's, uh, I'm trying to see if I can see a time on here. I don't. You're going to Google this, though. Um, after some hours, you literally fish the line up. Seriously, people. And then you um, examine the string um, under a microscope, and some of the trophozoites may uh, have attached to the string, so you can test uh, um, or examine for the presence of trophozoites. Um, seriously, I couldn't make this up, people, so um, Google that and see it for yourself. So anyways, to reiterate diagnosis, check um, uh, a number of stool samples for the presence of trophozoites or cysts, the good old string tests, and also testing for the presence of antibodies. Um, all right, let's see. Treatment. Same as we talked about with Entamoeba histolytica, metronidazole, flagyl, uh, but metronidazole has not been approved, at least at the time that I'm recording this, by FDA for the treatment of giardiasis. Uh, but I do have these notes, 
I think you've got most of this um, in your outline, but I'll go ahead and I'll um, talk about it for those of you that maybe don't have an outline. Um, metronidazole has been shown to be effective in 85% of cases. Um, there's another drug called um, furoxone. It is approved and uh, has shown to be, I don't have a percentage of, of um, uh, success, but uh, apparently that one's given for a seven to 10 day course of treatment. So if I ask you, what is the treatment for um, giardiasis? You can um, you can just go ahead and say either metronidazole or the um, uh, what was the new one uh, the the um, uh, furazone. Um, okay, uh, where am I? I think I got everything for giardia. Let's go ahead and move on to Trichomonas vaginalis. Now this causes a disease called Trichomoniasis considered to be an STD, sexually transmitted disease, or sometimes they say um, STI now, sexually transmitted infection. Uh, and um, in industrialized country, it's the most common protozoan causing infections in humans. Now, as I said, considered to be an STI. Uh, sexual transmission, although transmission by fomites is possible, but usually um, intimate contact is how it's transmitted. And this organism, Trichomonas, has a trophozoite stage only. There is no resistant cyst, so infection is not going to occur through the digestive system. Um, typically, uh, sexual intercourse is how it's going to be transmitted. All right, now it is um, common for individuals infected with trichomonas to be co-infected with Neisseria gonorrhea, and that's the bacterium that causes the disease known as gonorrhea. And for some individuals, trichomonas may be normal flora um, of the vagina or the urethra in men, uh, and um, in those individuals, it doesn't really cause a problem unless uh, um, the pH of the environment changes, and that will uh, um, select for the organism and allow it to grow at a fast enough rate that symptoms may develop. Um, those individuals that harbor trichomonas as normal flora, yes, they most certainly can transmit it to others and will through sexual intercourse. Okay, so trophozoid only, no cyst. Um, about 70% um, of infected individuals will be asymptomatic, at least for a significant period of time. Incubation, five to 28 days. All right, let's talk about symptoms when they do occur. Uh, women, if, um, if and when she does exhibit symptoms, they will include um, itching, burning, redness, soreness of the vaginal mucosa. Um, the itching is often described as being um, painful itching, um, discomfort upon urination, and um, the discharge, and again, I apologize, of a very foul-smelling, frothy material from the vagina. Uh, and this discharge, this frothy discharge, it may be um, clear or white or um, uh, yellow or even um, pale green. Now with men, we're going to see itching, painful itching of the um, urethra and um, um, quite a bit of irritation. Also a, uh, a discharge from the penis will be observed in infected males. As far as treatment goes, um, metronidazole is, um, is one possibility, um, and in many cases, one oral treatment uh, of metronidazole will be effective um, in eliminating the infection. Okay, we're still talking about phylomastigophora. Next on my list would be the trypanosomes, and these are blood tissue parasites. Uh, and they have, um, uh, you could describe their morphology as being pleomorphic, meaning ma having many shapes. They have several stages in their life cycles. Their life cycles are complex, um, and um, we're going to see the involvement of an intermediate host, uh, an insect acting as a vector of this protozoan to humans. Right, let's see what else do I want to tell you. I think I got everything in that introduction there, which you have in your notes. So um, if you turn the page in your outline, you're going to see a photograph of the stage of trypanosoma that we viewed in the laboratory, and that stage is known as the tryptomastigote. Now, uh, that is a, um, a, a kind of a crescent-shaped uh, cell with an undulating membrane and a, um, a flagella that are going to be visible using bright field microscopy. And when we view these slides, they are going to be blood smears because this is a blood parasite. All right, 
we've got um, some different um, species of trypanosoma that I want to talk to you about. First in your outline are, and I'm going to just kind of lump them together, they're not identical but good enough for what we're doing, uh, Trypanosoma gambiens and Trypanosoma rhodesiens, and those two species of Trypanosoma cause a disease called African sleeping sickness. And you can see the vector um, in, your, um, uh, in your outline, it's called the tsetse fly. And the tsetse fly uh, takes a blood meal on the human, and uh, if that human's infected, that's where they acquire the parasite. And then when they take their next blood meal, uh, they will transmit the parasite to um, uh, human number two. So the tsetse fly is our vector. All right, incubation. Um, again, according to Centers for Disease Control, 2015, one to three weeks. And then our patient is going to progress with um, headaches, apathy, um, over a period of months, they're going to begin to experience convulsions. They sleep more and more of the time, and without treatment, death will occur in about two to three years after infection. There are other treatments available, but um, I'm just, you know, in the um, in the spirit of trying to not overwhelm you with uh, uh, the top ten drugs used to treat a particular infection, we'll go with a drug called Melisperol. All right, I'm going to move on to Trypanosoma cruzi, and that one causes a disease called American trypanosomiasis, also called Chagas disease. Now, in 2015, Centers for Disease Control uh, declared American trypanosomiasis to be, um, what's the term they used, uh, a neglected parasitic disease in the United States. Right? I didn't realize it was as common as it is in, in the United States. Now, in this case, uh, the vector is also um, an insect, and it's called, um, oops, excuse me, the, um, the kissing bug. Uh, and um, what happens is this. All right, uh, so the kissing bug takes a blood meal from infected human, uh, and then it sleeps in uh, cracks and crevices during the day and comes out at night and uh, bites human number two, infects them um, with the uh, parasite, and um, but there's more to it than that. So the kissing bug, anyways, let's say we're right here, uh, and, and it often will bite on the face. So the kissing bug bites the individual, and then it, the bug, uh, turns around and poops on the individual. Well, apparently the uh, bite is painful. Person scratches the bite. The parasite is actually in the uh, feces of the insect. So when you scratch that bite, you are literally inoculating yourself with the parasite. Pretty nifty uh, method for um, getting yourself um, into a new host, yes? All right, let's see. I've got... I've got some uh, information about incidence of um, American trypanosomiasis in the United States, but we'll talk about that together when we're in class. This could be part of one of our activities. Okay, so human is bitten and uh, defecated on. They um, infect themselves by scratching. Uh, seven to 14 day incubation period, and then they're going to enter what we call the acute stage of the disease. And um, at this point, the patient may either be asymptomatic um, or they may have um, a, a slight fever, swollen lymph nodes, headaches, and um, at the site of the biting and pooping incident, and I want to make sure this is in your notes, it is, they're going to develop a, a lesion called a shagoma. Now, it looks pretty nasty to me, a big, open, ulcerating lesion. That's going to occur at the site of the, um, uh, where the bite took place. Uh, now, the shagoma will resolve, it will heal, disappear over the next few weeks. Now, if for whatever reason this patient was not diagnosed, but I'm thinking, you know, I have a large ulcerating lesion on my body, I'm probably going to go see my doctor, but you, you may make a different decision. Um, anyhow, uh, so the shagoma will heal and disappear. Over the next eight to 10 weeks, the patient enters what we call the chronic stage. All right, 60 to 70% of infected individuals won't experience any further symptoms. Their immune system eliminated the parasite, end of problem. Um, we will still be able to detect antibodies against the parasite um, in their system. Uh, 30 to 40% develop other symptoms 10 to 30 years later, uh, and they are asymptomatic in this uh, 10 to 30 year period until they start to exhibit the second set of symptoms. 
Now, a stage of the parasite called the amastigote, and they're just, you know, uh, they're not terribly exciting. They look like this. A mastigo, all right. These a mastigotes will become insisted, E N C Y S T E D, to form a cyst, insisted in muscle tissue throughout the heart. Also, will call, cause enlargement of heart valves. Uh, this is the, the 10 to 30 years later. Um, can cause um, an enlargement of the esophagus. They call that condition um, uh, megesophagus. Uh, the heart wall can weaken from uh, a mastigotes being insisted there. And the uh, colon may also become enlarged and blocked. I understand the amastigotes that have insisted in other tissues of the body cause quite a bit of pain. Right now, um, so we know about being infected by being bitten and pooped on by the uh, kissing bug, but infection with American trypanosomiasis can also occur uh, con in a congenital manner, meaning um, uh, vertical transmission from mother to child across the placental barrier. Uh, through contaminated blood products like blood transfusions, not common anymore. But uh, a couple of decades ago before blood was screened as exhaustively as it is now, that was a common means of transmission. Um, an organ transplanted from an infected individual, okay, I'm sure we're testing our organs for uh, things like this. Um, a laboratory accident, okay, we could talk about that. Um, contaminated food or drink. I have a note that this is quite rare and I'm having trouble really coming up with a scenario. I guess, well, I don't know, whatever. We can talk about that. All right, uh, treatment. Um, uh, uh, Banizadol is the drug of choice. Is that in your notes? No, here, um, I'll write it down for you, okay? spelled it right okay google it let me know if I'm wrong I'm sure you will okay that's the treatment of choice and it's effective during the acute stage of the disease if this disease is allowed to progress it becomes increasingly difficult to cure uh, if we treat the disease early in uh, the course of the, the disease we're going to see about an 80 percent um, cure rate not very effective during chronic um, phases of the disease Okay, I'm going to go ahead and break. I'm sure this uh, segment is longer than I want. And when I come back, we will finish up the protozoans with a brief talk about uh, phyla, ciliata, and sporozoa. Thanks, as always, for watching, you guys.